The Monuments Men were a group of men and women, museum directors, curators, art historians, artists, architects, and librarians who volunteered for service during World War II. These were accomplished people with established careers, average age 40 years old, most with families, that walked away from having it made to volunteer to help save the greatest cultural treasures in Europe from the destruction of World War II and theft by the Nazis. One of the great joys of researching these people was getting to know the handful of men and women that we write about in Monuments Men and getting to know their personal stories because after all, it really is a people's story. One of the heroes that we write about in The Monuments Men is a fellow named Harry Etlinger. He's one of our living Monuments Men. He's 83 years old. Harry's story begins in Karlsruhe, Germany. He was the last Jewish boy to have a bar mitzvah in 1938 before fleeing with his family to the United States. They arrived in New Jersey. He worked two jobs while he was going to school and in the course of time was drafted into the U.S. Army. In fact, he became a U.S. citizen while in the Army and went to fight in an old country, a war representing a new one. If I were to ask you to name the greatest heroine of World War II, who would you think of? Perhaps Rosie the Riveter, a composite figure. But in fact, one of the things that excites me so much about the telling of the Monuments Men story is the introduction of a woman I believe is the greatest heroine of World War II, a French lady named Rose Vallon. Rose worked in the Jeux de Pomme Museum adjacent to the Louvre, and she worked under the watchful eyes of the Nazis for four long years. She recorded secretly information concerning their theft of paintings from thousands of collectors throughout Paris and France. July 23rd, 1943. The paintings slashed at the Louvre storage area have been brought back to the Jeu de Paume. One entire truck, approximately five to 600, and burned from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the museum garden under German surveillance. Impossible to save anything. At its heart, The Monuments Men is a story about people. Allow me then one personal story. On November 1st, 2006, I flew to Williamstown, Massachusetts to meet with Monuments Man S. Lane Faison, Jr., who served as a member of the OSS, precursor to the CIA. Although 98 years old, Lane was in seemingly good health. Still, I was warned in advance by Gordon, one of his four sons, that Pop hasn't been staying awake for periods much longer than 30 minutes, so don't be disappointed if you don't learn very much from your conversation. And what a conversation it was, lasting almost three hours as Lane flipped through my first book, Rescuing Da Vinci, a photographic tribute to the work of the Monuments Men, stopping periodically to stare intently at images that seemed to transport him back in time. Over and again, as his memory was jogged, the twinkle in his eye appeared, and his arms moved enthusiastically with the telling of each amazing story until we both needed to stop. Gordon was in disbelief, a sentiment each of his brothers later echoed. As I rose to say goodbye, I walked to the side of his recliner and extended my hand to thank him. Lane reached out and firmly clasped it with both of his hands, pulled me close, and said, I've been waiting to meet you all my life. Ten days later, a week shy of his 99th birthday, Lane died. It was Veterans Day. At the end of the day, The Monuments Men is a love story. It's love of the country they were serving, love of the art and culture they tried to save, and love for the families they left behind. Writing now makes me feel as if I had lost at least one of my senses. I can't hear you or see you, and I wonder if you hear me. One thing is quite sure, I love you. Yours, George.